Operation Confidence proudly presents America's Invisible Heroes Radio Talk Show. Tune in weekly on Sundays from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time with your host, Consuela Mackey, co-host, U.S. Air Force veteran, Matt Davidson, announcers, Taylor Marcella and Brooke Gadesi, U.S. Army veteran and entertainment host, Charles Whitehead, U.S. Army Special Forces veteran, and I once was whole segment host, Richard Cook. U.S. Army veteran and lifeline for women's veterans segment host, Martha Elena Varela. National Faith Program Director and Veterans in Recovery segment host, Anthony Akinpora. And U.S. Air Force veteran and incarceration to success segment host, Kevin Lewandowski. For more information or to be a guest on our show, email info at operationconfidence.org. Operation Confidence is a grassroots nonprofit. The organization's mission is to provide stable housing for veterans who have experienced homelessness, as well as providing a wide range of supportive services. To help accomplish our goal, a successful landowner has donated land for the project, a world-renowned architect has offered to design the houses, and construction classes from the local community colleges will take part in building the houses. Your support and donations are needed. To get involved, please visit our website at www.operationconfidence.org or email info at operationconfidence.com. Okay, well, welcome everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Americans Invisible Heroes a show dedicated to our veterans and their families. Yes, I'm your host, Consuela Mackey, Executive Director of a grassroots nonprofit organization called Operation Confidence. No, I'm not a vet, but my heart goes out to our American heroes, especially those with disabilities and have experienced homelessness. For those who are new to the show, American Invisible Heroes was established to provide a platform for our veterans to be able to share their heartfelt stories, resources, challenges, and accomplishments. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our amazing co-hosts. We have Charles Whitehead. He's a U.S. Army Reserve veteran and a board member. We have Brooke Adasky. She's a board member and one of the announcers. Taylor Marcella, also a board member and announcer. U.S. Army veteran Martha Varela, she's an on our advisory board and she has a weekly segment called Lifeline for, Lifeline for Women Veterans. Although Martha won't be on today, she's in Minnesota. She was going to try to, to uh, come on from there, but she's had some, some internet problems. So anyway, we'll see Martha next week. And then we have Richard Cook. Richard Cook uh, is a U.S. Army Special Forces veteran. He has a monthly segment called I Once Was Whole. Say hello to everyone and say hello, give a little wave so everyone knows who you are. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> okay. In honor of Black History Month, we're going to take it away to you, Charles, and tell us about what your presentation is today. My Black History presentation is right here. Charles is running a little ragged today, so. Yeah, you know. it's an ism. It is. You know, <laughs> I can claim my isms. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyways, here we go. Thank you for tuning in to America's Invisible Heroes. Um, a show dedicated to the veterans, right? That's what Connie said. So what I'm going to say is this. In honor of Black History Month, I'd like to tell our viewers about the Buffalo Soldiers, the African-American troops that served on the Western Front after the Civil War. The Buffalo Soldier was a nickname given to men in the all-black U.S. Army regiments who served in the Western Frontier after the Civil War. The Buffalo Soldiers were tasked with controlling the Native Americans of the Plains capturing cattle rustlers and thieves and protecting the settlers. Despite enduring several severe racism, they became legendary for fighting courageously and for expanding America westward. After the Civil War ended on April 19, 1865, the U.S. Congress allowed African Americans to join the Army during peacetime as soldiers. 
Many black people jumped at that opportunity. They hoped that serving their country would shield them from poverty and racism, but it didn't. But treating black soldiers equally was the last thing on the government's mind. African Americans who listed in the army were segregated into six all-black regiments. These were eventually melted, melded into four black regiments, made up of two infantry units, the 24th and 25th infantry, and two cavalry units, the 19th and 10th, the 9th and 10th cavalry. The regiments were usually commanded by whites, and the rank and file faced racial prejudice from the army establishment. Many officers, such as George Armstrong Custer, refused to command black soldiers at all, even if it cost them, their, cost them promotions in rank. The U.S. dispatched these black troops, who made up roughly a tenth of the armed forces, toward the West. At the beginning, black soldiers were only stationed at locations west of the Mississippi, where most towns were still undeveloped. According to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Many whites didn't want to see armed black soldiers in or near their communities. The black troops were mainly tasked with defending settler territories against Native Americans, who fought with all their might to keep their lands. Frequent skirmishes with the black troops led the Native American warriors to call them the Buffalo Soldiers. It's unclear why the indigenous warriors coined the name, but it's suspected that it was either a reference to the black soldiers' dark curly hair or their strategic military fare, both of which the natives associated with the mighty buffalo. Either way, buffaloes are revered in many Native American countries, American tribes that is, so the nickname was considered a sign of respect toward the black troops. Perhaps the most notable member of the regiments was Lieutenant Henry Ocean Flipper, who was the first black graduate of West Point in 1877. Lieutenant Ocean Flipper, um, he lived from March 21, 1856 to April 40 of, uh, till April 26, 1940. He was an American soldier, engineer, former slave, and in 1877, the first African American to graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point, earning a commission as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. Upon his graduation, Flipper was commissioned as a second lieutenant and assigned to the 10th Cavalry Regiment, making him the first black officer to command soldiers in the regular U.S. Army. 18, American, 18 African American Buffalo soldiers earned medals of honor for their service during this period. Contemporary historians underline the irony of black soldiers seizing nat native lands while the soldiers themselves were discriminated against for being African American. However, it's also important to remember that the soldiers were, were often being instructed by their white superiors to follow these orders, so they didn't have much of a choice if they wanted to keep their jobs. For African Americans, both free men and those formerly enslaved, joining the, the military was supposed to be a way of escape, a way to dis escape discrimination. Didn't happen that way. Unfortunately, even with valiant contrib contributions by the Buffalo soldiers who built up the American West, the military remained segregated until the Korean War. As awareness about the foreign contributions of black service members grow, efforts to honor them have come to the forefront in preserving U.S. history, including the story of mighty Buffalo soldiers. And uh, You have the lieutenant's uh, picture. Do you still have it in your file? Let's see if I have the lieutenant's picture. You know, I'm telling you, Kanye, I'm, I'm, I'm all, you know, today for whatever reason it is, uh, um, I have it. He's usually on point. I know it, you know, but see, that's what happens, you know, when you get old like me. <laughs> okay. We'll let you get away with I'm, that. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find okay, it. Okay, you can come back with it. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Uh, taking Martha's place, since I said, shared with you earlier, she's stuck in Minnesota. Take it away for her, uh, Brooke. Okay, wait. Before we go, here's this picture. You found it? I found it. Let me hear. This is Mr. Flipper himself. There the dude is, you know. First black, you know, lieutenant, first black officer, soldier, you know, so this guy was, uh, he was doing this thing, 
He looks young too, right there. You know. He was the first to enter West Point, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, That's he, an amazing accomplishment. Yes, he was. And so, you know, we got to give it up to guys like him, you know. Uh, you know, right. you, you don't hear a lot of stories about these guys, uh, you know, because, of course, you know, we deal with uh, suppression of uh, facts and all of that stuff. But, you know, he, mm -hmm. he, he made it, you know, so he was a good he was one that uh, helped. Unfortunately, he had to help suppress the uh, indigenous folks. But, you know, right. he, he was there. All right. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on you, Brooke, taking Martha's uh, presentation. You got it. House approved bill to automatically enroll vets in VA healthcare. Eligible veterans would be automatically enrolled in the Department of Veterans Affairs healthcare system under a bill passed by the House on Thursday. The House voted 265 to 163 to approve the Ensuring Veterans Smooth Transition or E. VESP Invest Act. The vote fell strong, largely along party lines, though 44 Republicans joined Democrats to support the bill. Right now, veterans must proactively apply for health care benefits at the VA. The bill approved Thursday would require the department to instead automatically enroll veterans who meet existing eligibility criteria for VA health care. The VA would also have to provide a way for veterans to opt out of coverage. The bill, which does not change who is eligible for VA health benefits, would apply retroactively to veterans discharged 90 days before it becomes law. The bill must still be voted on by the Senate before being sent to the president to be signed into law. Supporters of the bill touted it as a common sense measure that will help ease the transition from military to civilian life. We know that the months following transition out of the military can be very stressful and particularly risky for new veterans in terms of mental health. House Veterans Affairs Committee Chairman Mark DeCano, who's a Democrat from California, sponsored the bill said Thursday on the House floor. This helps simplify the process and prevents veterans from potentially missing out on life-saving care. It also keeps veterans from having to opt in to VA care later and attempt to navigate a new bureaucracy on their own. The bill could affect about 58,000 veterans annually who might otherwise not enroll in VA healthcare, according to estimates from the Congressional Budget Office or CBO. The bill could cost about 3.1 billion over the next five years, the CBO estimated. In a statement last week, the White House said it supports the goal of the bill of seamless enrollment in healthcare coverage. But the White House also expressed concern that there may be challenges implementing this bill as drafted, adding that the, com the administration looks forward to working out the issues with Congress. Leaving the military wasn't easy, Rep. Mike Boast from Illinois, the ranking member of the House Veterans Affairs Committee and a main Marine veteran said on the House floor, it can leave new veterans feeling adrift and alone. I've been there. Boast says he wants troops to get the services they need in a seamless manner when they end military service. I am not at all confident that this bill will accomplish that goal without harming services to other veterans and adding to the national debt, he said. Questions about this can be addressed to Rebecca Keel, rebecca.keel at military.com. Can you repeat her, her information? Sure, it's rebecca.keel at military.com. Um, I imagine you'll have this on the website too, Connie, right? If people wanted to get more information right. about that. Mm -hmm. Right, it'll be on the website. Thank you so much, Brooke. Now we're going to move right along to uh, our next guest, which is uh, one of our super duper segment hosts. Uh, please let me introduce our monthly segment host, U.S. Army Special Forces veteran Richard Cook. Richard Cook worked as a security in the Army involved with intelligence. He was assigned to AKA, the mission he had to work on potential threats, as well as bodyguard to protect generals and admirals from Schofield Barracks, Tripper Army Hospital to Fort Shafter, also known as the Circle. He worked with Interpol missions while traveling around the world. In 2000, while at his Army duty station, Goldfield Barracks, the Army doctors gave him a blood test and later found his cholesterol was very high, but never said how to lower or control it. 
Later, due to many situations while in the Army, in 2016, Richard had three strokes, including the worst one, a massive stroke that caused a lot of brain damage and left blindness in his left eye. After 33 years, he had to retire, but knew he had done his best to protect his country. Richard's stroke challenges never stopped him. We, the team, think of him as a role model for other stroke victims. He participates in 5K walks, rock climbing, archery competition with other paralyzed veterans, deep sea fishing, and much more. He is also an accomplished modeling agent and photographer whose company Pro Level Entertainment is in all 50 states, including American Samoa, Guam, Saipan, and Puerto Rico. The agency was really recently approved by the federal government, such as with the Department of Justice in the state of California. Richard also has a bestseller book, I Once Withhold, sold on Amazon. His guest today is Marine veteran Frankie Firm. He won't Tinkoff. be on today. He's guest. Oh. Yeah, he had, he had an unexpected emergency. But take well, it away, okay. Richard. Okay, hi, everybody. I'm going to start this way. This last Saturday, yesterday, it was a very fulfilling event with on the USS Iowa. I sent some photos all forward as well too, to, so you can see what I was doing. But I was there to promote, one, the book, and also the photos that I have taken <coughs> excuse me, as well. So I've been taking those photos. I put those up on the USS Iowa. They were displayed right there yesterday, and everybody was amazed by them. Also, what was it? Where did you go? What was the event? Uh, it was uh, uh, vet, the vet cafe program that they had, and uh, at the we VA. Were, yeah, no, at the USS Iowa. Okay. So, so that organization had the program right there, and then I was selected as one of the artists, and so it was my photo art, but also I was given permission to display my book as well too. And I had uh, 43 people want the book. And so I signed and autographed the book. So I did a book signing yesterday as well. That was great. Do you have his pictures, uh, Charles? Oh, I sure do. But for whatever reason, <laughs> my, you know, I bring up this, you know, it's just not, uh, let me, I don't know what's going on with my computer today, you know. Um, keep talking, Rich. Keep talking. Yeah. So anyways, it was a fulfilling event yesterday. Even some people that I know uh, at South 2 or that I grew up with, they were there and they were surprised to see me, actually, because most people, I guess, who have had strokes are not as active fluent or able to do things. Yeah. So they are active, you know, so they were surprised to see me. I was there and one works for the VA hospital in Long Beach. So uh, we you know, she, she said, I remember you. So, so the thing is, uh, we, we got reconnected at, in that point as well. And so we had a good time, all, the whole program with everybody who are veterans with their arts that were displayed. And of course, I had my photo art as well, too. That was great. How many participants were there yesterday? Uh, participants by themselves, as far as uh, the veterans. Right. Uh, rough, roughly about 30. Okay, and um, and the VA hosted it. You said it was called Vet. What was it called again? It's Vet VetCafe.org. So okay. the thing is, uh, uh, the VA didn't host it, but the organization that hosted it was that particular name right there. And that's some of his artwork. I mean, it's amazing how, without much sight, how he can take some of these beautiful photographs and frame them. That's really pretty. And all of this was on display, huh? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. so that one is a new one right there with the U USS Iowa. So I uh -huh. took advantage and took that photo uh, just yesterday as well, too. Okay. That's that beautiful. Good. That's really, really pretty. Thank you. You'll have more. And you're going to have some of this, some of your work displayed at the, at Laura's uh, op uh auction right. museum right right yeah and, and that's I'll, how you have I'll, to display it right I yeah I'll, I'll bring those in the very near future that way she can actually show that they've been submitted yeah she'll be able to show that in the slideshow right. 
That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving right along here. It's on, it's on you, Taylor. You, you're muted. There we go. Got it. Hi. Uh, <laughs> Miss uh, Rhonda Harris um, established the Veterans Resource Program in Richmond, California, in honor of her father, who was a wounded um, Korean War veteran. Um, it was founded in January 11, 2011. Uh, in honor, well, in honor of her late brother, Lou Ms. Harris founded the BRP to assist veterans with housing, applying for benefits, and higher educational opportunities to help them transition back into society through gainful employment. I apologize if you hear my dogs barking. The um, Veterans Resource Program owns a fully furnished home in Richmond, California, which provides housing to veterans of all branches who may need short or long-term accommodations. The VRP was incorporated in August of 2013 and became a certified 501c3 in August of 2014. As a member of a military family, Rhonda began serving homeless veterans before it became the right thing to do. She founded the Veterans Resource Program to express her love for her father, a veteran, and the veteran community. She is the founder and executive director of BRP. Ms. Harris serves in the California State Army Military Reserve as a sergeant. Ms. Harris is also a 2013 Jefferson Award recipient. Awesome. MEA Magazine Award for 25 Influential Women in Business earned a, certifi earned a certification as a drug and alcohol counselor from Mount Diablo Valley College. She is a financial officer for the American Legion, Cesar Chavez, Cesar Chavez Post 505, and a member of Veterans Healing Veterans from the Inside Out Group in San Quentin Prison. Ooh, take it away, Rhonda. All right. Oh, wow. Thank you. Appreciate that, um, Taylor. Congratulations, Richard. I love your art and your book. I would love to get a co signed copy. So whatever I need to do to get that, uh, we would put that in our veterans uh, uh, resource facility so our vets can read that. That's and some great. of your art. Yes, indeed. We believe in supporting. Well, thank you for inviting me, uh, Consuela, to be My with you. Pleasure. After My pleasure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I, I can't go without saying how I met uh, Miss Consuela. I, I was in the throes of uh, getting ready for our veterans Christmas. I give them an annual Christmas uh, get together party. And I'm a part of the clubhouse, uh, the military real estate group, which they changed the name. But that's what it was in December. And when I came on, I said, oh, my God, I'm missing it. I'm, I'm a part of it. I'm a moderator. So I said, let me jump in for a minute and just stay on hold and listen. And so as soon as I got in, they said, oh, here she is. We needed to talk to you. We want you to talk to somebody. We got you. Oh, and I'm like, I can't talk to nobody really right now. But I thought, OK, what's up? And they said, they told us about um, Consuela and told me what uh, what she was going through. And I went, OK, let me see. And I spoke to her and I'll tell you, have you ever been in a position where you meet someone and uh, you, it takes off like as if you've been knowing them for years? Right. I mean, it's exactly you know, right. Yeah. It's like it's a bond. And I spoke to her. Then I spoke to her offline. And uh, we begin to develop a, a, a bond there. Sisterhood. A, a sisterhood, specifically doing what we do. We, we both do the same thing, right? Right. Uh, at least, uh, you know, that's where we're, she's going the same direction we're going. So thank you, Taylor, for reading um, that information. I, um, I am Rhonda Harris. Uh, my father was a wounded Korean War veteran. Um, my brother was in Vietnam. Uh, who my father honored, still honored the country, no matter what he went through. My brother, ah, uh, another whole different story because of the, what he went through with Agent Orange and his children, and it just. Oh, I had a brother that went through that too. Oh my God! It just died night and day. Right. Uh, but at this time, you know, keeping him in prayer, he lives in Houston because he is ill. 
uh, Agent Orange has done some really uh, some severe damage to his his um, kidney, and so my mom says he's he's in a wheelchair. So yeah, and he's only I think he may be seventy one or something. So he's a young. So the, nevertheless. In honor of my dad, how did that happen? We have a property in Richmond that we were, uh, um, we were, uh, um, I won't say, um, we were providing services for our youth that was in Richmond now who were in gang violence. And these rich uh, individuals could not get into your typical training programs. So that it, it ended. It ended well, too, because many of those youth uh, who were uh, gang bangers and uh, violence and tearing up and drug users and selling it. And they became very productive citizens. And so we thank, uh, really thank God for that journey. That's but after that, I was on my way to Santa Barbara with an associate of mine. And uh, we were talking about the, the, the home and what we were going to do with it. And I said, you know, I want to honor my dad. I want to honor my daddy. And he said, Daddy, was, you said, yeah, he was a veteran. I said, yeah, I want to do something that honor my daddy. So the vision actually and the mission, everything came about on the train going to Santa Barbara. And so um, for that, we came back to Richmond and things just start falling into place. Now, mind you, I had not had two nickels to rub together, as I always say. Uh, but the doors. That sounds familiar. <laughs> The doors start opening. Right. Uh, the, the, the previous tenant that was in the property, she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this furniture. And I said, wow. Talk to her. She says, come and get it. She said, you can have anything you want for $500. I went, whoa. Huh? I furnished the entire five-bedroom home. They have wow. enough room for seven veterans to stay. So that's how we started with it. That's the journey for the, the beginning of it. And then it's just starting to evolve. Um, again, we um, have room for seven vets. One of the veterans who came, he was couch surfing. Uh, he stayed there nine years. And because, yes. And because we do not take federal funds, because federal funds have limitations, you <laughs> have to leave. And he, he couldn't see himself. Moving out. He just couldn't. And so my thing was acclimate back into society takes time. You can't give a veteran a year, two years and give them a time clock. Sorry, you got to go. Not me. I wasn't doing it. I wasn't playing by the by their rule book. So right. therefore, we did not go that route. And I'm telling you uh, right now, because our mission is to ensure that veterans come in homeless, they're homeless that they get gainful employment. We have a veteran right now, not only did he get his disability, is 100%. He works at the San Francisco airport. Wow, and that's a great well, job. Yes, he is. So we have, um, we've stepped out on our mission to ensure that veterans from uh, a homeless, which our mantra, from homelessness to wholeness, you come in homeless, you're not leaving. Home. You're leaving out whole. Right. <laughs> that is because of all the what, that, what we have been able to offer our veterans. And so uh, we have programs. Uh, at least we did have these programs in place until COVID came and shook us up a little bit. But that's okay. Uh, yoga. We found that veterans love yoga. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, NAAA. Uh, a bike program for them to uh, have exercise. There is a green way that's not too far from the veterans facility. Um, they also have computer literacy and not only for that, but open up to the community. So we had one uh, veteran come in, his uh, veteran's wife, she was 86 and she learned how to get on the computer. She learned. Yes. I, I give it up so, to her because I can't get my mother to do it to this day. Really? And she said, and so my, how old is she? 78. You know. Really? So my mom is 89 and she does, she does better than us with Facebook. I'm telling her, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, but I'll tell you, so on this journey, uh, a part of our goal was to ensure that veterans uh, have other places to, to, to stay through expansion. So we were going to expand homes uh, from a developer's perspective. I did development, still am doing it. 
whereas I would I, in the community, which was infested with drugs and um, violence. So I went in and bought homes, rehabbed them, and ensured that I uh, rented them out to those who are of the low income, disabled, who use it for foster care. One of the other girls used it for clean and sober living. That's all up my up my alley. And so um, with that being said, we also had an opportunity to train in the in the community and hire young men who no longer again wanted to be in that environment. So we hired them to watch our um, our, our properties, our properties right. while they were being rehabbed. So the facility where we are now is one of those that was a drug pro, uh, drug house. And so um, again, we've been there eleven years. Um, so from homelessness, from homelessness to wholeness, and they can come from uh, San Quentin, uh, just the military family that want to be st stabilized, because this is community living, right? That doesn't fit the mold for everybody. But most veterans who come from out of homeless, they really don't care. If you're sleeping under a freeway, which we had some who sleep under there, they didn't mind. Mm -hmm. So, and on the journey, we have some have went on. You know, they've gone on and they are very successful. Then we've had some who have passed on, uh, but they right. stay with us. We give them memorial services. But right now, where are we? We have in 1985, there was, well, I go back 2014. I had an opportunity to present to the city manager of Richmond at that time um, to address homeless veterans in a larger scale. I said, we would like to provide housing for veterans. We want to expand and we want you as a partner. So we want you to help us as we identify lots. They were on board. As a matter of fact, the city manager thought, excellent, we're on board. And so we, we singled out a lot that I was driving by and I'm like, yeah, this is it. 2.3 acres, yeah. So we showed them the lot. They said it was fine. And after the research had been done by the planning department, come to find out that they don't own the lot like they thought they owned it. And not only that, it was contaminated, contaminated. Wow. Yeah. So they had to back out. And I, me, I, I'm not trying to give up easy, but I, it hurt. It hurt a lot because we were on a roll. And so um, kind of, you know, did my little tear thing and prayed and had some others with me doing the same praying and crying. And we like, I said, you know what? I'm going for that lot. Because in 1985, when it was purchased by these, this group, this developer group, they found out it was contaminant and they walked off. When they walked away with a, a facility, a development next door that was women and children. Shame on them, right? Ah, that really got to us. So the contaminants were cleaned up. DTSD came in, the Department of Substance and Toxins, right, control. They came in and did a cleanup. Um, so then as time went on, the uh, cleanup did not suffice because of new administrations. Um, matter of fact, when Obama came in, he changed the level of, uh, uh, of raised it, how what you could you no longer develop on property. And that was one of them. Long story of that one was I did, was determined to get the property. And so for four years, four years, we worked and we called and we searched and we sought and we prayed and we did. We never stopped. We even walked the land. We walked all of it, 2.3 acres, saying this was our land. And December the uh, 14, 2018, the, lot, the property became the Veterans Resource Program. We went down to the county records office. <laughs> yeah, we had to go through foreclosures too. We had to make them announced and everything because of the, the owners. Some of them had passed on. Then we had one who wanted to swindle us. He wanted us to pay him. Wow. Like, <laughs> so where are we are today is 2022. We own the property and we now have a developer. We will build 268 housing units in three phases that will consist of housing for homeless, <clears throat> housing for independent living, and housing for assisted living along with their spouse or their partner. Three buildings, a campus 
That will include all wraparound services, which will have an entrepreneurship program, a culinary arts program, arts, we love the arts, computer, we will have a gymnasium, we will have a top flight facility with all the amenities, a clinic, a chapel, it goes on, a business, we were, we're talking about cafes, uh, everything now that they want, they won't have to leave this campus if they do not want to. That's where we are. Our, our developer is from Richmond and him and his wife, they no longer live here, but they are just like, uh, you know, they, they're like a, a mouse with a piece of cheese too. They're very excited about this because they want to do something for veterans and they wanted to always do a pro uh, project, a uh, meaningful project as such in the city of Richmond where they're from. Wow. So that's where we are currently. I also work with the VA on contract. I've been working with them for 10 years. So I do veterans housing there. I have four sites where veterans are placed and about 25 vets. And so I'm here and there and everywhere. I actually just left the city. And so it's a wonderful journey. I'm quite humble. I'm grateful. Um, and, and to be in a position to serve like this. Uh, this is what my heart desire is. I'm very passionate for what I do. And uh, we, we, we pull no stops, no punches. We, we're straight, we're forward. This is what we want to do. Matter of a fact, one of the board of directors, I said, why don't you just stop at one time? He said, I don't see no way you're going to get the land. And I stopped. I told him, if you like to go, and you like to go head on, you may go, but I'm not stopping. Right, there you go. Sounds sim oh. sounds quite similar. <laughs> but we want to congratulate you, sweetheart, for your efforts for our veterans. They, they need organizations like yours and Operation Confidence. And we're just thrilled to have you on. You're going to bring yeah. back some of your colleagues and share some of the stories. And we're going to make this happen, you know, and I'm happy to have met you we're getting ready to do some great collaborative outreach together and yes our best yes so, ma'am thank you for letting me come thank you all. don't let this be your last visit now i told you i want you to think about us i know you're a busy girl but I know. Know, think about coming back and sharing more you know then you guys enjoy yes, that yes, oh yeah yes <laughs> make, make sure you include a, a, a social hall for these people now because you know they might be living together but if they can't congregate together then you know it's like uh you know living ho homeless no absolutely charles absolutely they will have and what i love about the developer he says this is not going to be a, a b or a c this is a a this is going to be a right. A-class facility, he says. He wants you that. He wants cool. the best for our vets. I was so, honored yeah. to have met Ron, too. Let him know I'm still waiting on his call as well. Yes, He's going to help us as well. He's yes, ma'am. He All is. Right. Really cool. Nice. And if Thank anyone you. has any questions or want to get in touch with me, go through Coswella, I guess, and anything you can, uh, that you need, I'm here for you. Uh, Thank how, you. Uh, how, how can they get in touch with you? Um, Rhonda Harris, uh, my uh, email address is veteransnet, that's one word, at gmail. Great. And my phone number is 510-816-9313. Repeat it. 510-816-9313. And we'll put your information on our website as well. You'll okay. send that to me. Okay, well, thank yeah, you. Can I, can I say something, please? Yes, yeah, sure. I would like to send you a copy of my book if you would like that. Communicate oh, yeah. with me on my email, which is a uh, oh. Gmail, which is pro level, like pro professional level, pro level entertainment 62 at gmail.com. Okay, I got it. So pro level entertainment 62? Yes. Gotcha. Gmail.com. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Like we'll sign copy now. That's right. Sign right. copy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it'll be a sign copy. Great. Yeah. Right. Great. It's on you, Taylor. That's to resolve hotel ABA complaints. 
to all veterans and, and civilians, the first set of ADA accessible design standards were put into place nearly 30 years ago, and the grace period for, her, for hotels to reach ADA compliance is over. Travelers should expect consistency in the design of accessible hotel rooms and bathrooms, regardless of which hotel they select. Unfortunately, many hotels have not adhered to the ADA standards, causing problems for travelers with disability. When you encounter an ADA violation that limits or restricts you or, or restricts your use of a hotel room, you should not remain silent. Follow these steps to resolve accessibility issues, whether before, during, or after your stay. Before your stay, avoid, um, before your stay, you should avoid accessibility issues. Here are three things that you can do to prevent an ADA violation at a hotel from ruining, from ruining your vacation. Select a hotel that has been recommended and tested by a friend or family member who understands your accessibility needs. Search the internet for reviews and photos of the accessible rooms for accessible room features and hotel services and amenities before booking your stay. Get started by looking through the large directory of wheelchair accessible hotel reviews. Call the hotel directly and ask for specific information like bed height, shower design, door width, swimming pool accessibility, etc. Et Hotels are required to provide the, this information upon request. Travelers with disabilities have a right to expect that their accessible room will be ADA compliant. Unfortunately, that is not always the case. If you encounter an issue that you are not able or willing to tolerate, take these steps to resolve the issue. If the ADA violation relates to the hotel's physical design or construction, ask the hotel to accommodate you in another room that is ADA compliant either at their hotel or another nearby. If you are willing to make do with less than full ADA compliance, explain how the hotel can best accommodate you. For example, in a roll-in shower without the required built-in shower seat, are you willing to accept the portable shower chair? As a last resort, ask for a refund of your room charges and take the matter up later. The ADA is not new and hotels have been required to observe the law's regulatory and design requirements for decades. As such, there should be penalties imposed on hotels that do not fulfill their responsibility to comply. In an ideal world, the government would handle these matters for us, but oftentimes it is up, it is up to us to act. Rick? Uh -oh. I'm here, I'm here. You back? Can, can, can I just here. say something on this uh, uh, ADA thing? Being, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, using a wheelchair since 1987 and being a sports fanatic, you know, I played uh, wheelchair football, basketball, all that stuff. When you travel, you know, and, and these are the things that are uh, even more challenging. You know, when you got a city that's hosting a wheelchair basketball tournament, and you all stand at these hotels there's only so many rooms so guess what you end up uh having a non-accessible uh room and that's just the way it is so right. a lot of times you know being uh, the athletes you have to learn how to uh adapt and use um sliding chairs or put them into the restroom you know or chairs to you know with the, like the chairs that come in the room so you know, it's not a very easy thing to do. And so you know, these are challenges that that are presented by having, uh, you know, mass conference conferences with uh, multiple, with, uh, you know, uh, a multitude of wheelchair users. So mm -hmm. things like that, you know, you, these are things that don't, we, we, are, we don't often think about, but that you go through. And the ADA has nothing to help you on that end, so. Right, right. But, you know, there are a lot of things that uh, the ADA helps with. Uh, so I would also like to add that um, there are Facebook pages and social media pages that cater to individuals with disabilities to help them during their travel. And there are tons of recommendations and pros and cons of all of that. So the information and knowledge is out there. Sometimes you just have to do a little digging to get it, but it's there. Well, I thought it was important for Taylor to be able to uh, share this information. She too is a wheelchair user and 
now going for a master's degree at UCLA, Taylor? USC, it's, USC, it's, USC. USC, 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 that's right. <laughs> All it's right. so fabulous. She's so fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. that's my my sweetheart. She's doing some amazing things despite her limitations. So we want to congratulate you and thank you so much for that presentation. It was extremely yeah. needed. And let me add one more thing that, that kind of gets caught on the you know the that uh, ADA doesn't pick up on. Now mm -hmm. I went to San Jose for Christmas. And I was standing, it was a nice, you know, room. Uh, me and my sister went up there and we stayed in this hotel. It was very ADA compliant, except the door, you had to be a weightlifter to push those doors open. They're yeah. very hairy, very heavy, you know. And see, these are things that don't, uh, you know, somebody who doesn't use a chair doesn't think about. So, I mean, that's something that we need to kind of in, include in the. Uh, you know, the ADA um, mm -hmm. updates, you know, because it's, I mean, a door, I mean, very heavy. You know how those hotel doors can be, yeah. you, know, right. there, you know, I mean, I'm like, shoot, an able-bodied person was having trouble pushing that door open, so. You, you know. mean the, to the door to the to The, the door room to the room, room, yes. Wow. The yeah. door yeah. to the room. I would suggest that they should be something like most other facilities. They will have a handicap button which will open know. up the exactly. door. Exactly, yeah, I've seen those too. Well, well you know. it may be up to people such as us to have that committee as well. Because uh, for years I sat on the uh, City of Los Angeles Department of Disabilities uh, as a commissioner, and that particular department is no longer in existence. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's up to us to be able to, you know, get out and and advocate for our individuals with disabilities, especially yeah. the hotels and others, you know, because yeah, yeah. that's so important. And I've seen other uh, facilities. For example, a girlfriend of mine was um, a very well-known uh, uh, performer, had a great, great show she wanted everybody to come out to, but it was upstairs. And the first thing I do is go in and look for, well, how, how is the individual wheelchair going to get upstairs? And there was no such accommodation. So it was should have been reported. You know, how in the heck did they even have such a, a, a restaurant or, uh, you know, a place for, you know, or performance and no, no way you can get up there. So these are some of the things that we need to challenge as well, go after, because it's not fair. Yeah. When when I had my CD release party, uh -huh. the stage was uh, a good five feet high. It was at least five feet high, and and it took about six or seven people lifting me up to the stage. And I had people that came from work who were PTs and all. Oh, then they were all just like cringing, you know, like they just cause, you know but you know you know because you couldn't get up there on the stairs you know and, and i'm like this is where the the, the guy who post the uh booked it at this place that's nine wheelchair mm -hmm. i mean also yeah, yeah see that's not right but see mm -hmm. i'm fortunate for me you know i, I do uh, you know daredevil stuff so uh, <laughs> that's right i know jump out of airplane stuff around he's no joke despite his wheelchair <laughs> Like it was, it was jump off. What was that you just did with with uh, paral He's on the board of Paralyzed Residents of America. Went off the the the, uh, the over the edge with the Long Beach Hilton. Um, we went down and uh, you know scaled the, the the 14th floor to the from top 14th floor to the bottom of the ground in my wheelchair. You know. Wasn't all of that, you know. Oh my God! <laughs> and they gonna try to lure me into that next year. Yeah, huh? You, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> well, bring you too, Rhonda. Bring Brooke, Taylor. Well, well, one, one, one plus is for me is I've always wanted to um, parachute, and I've been wanting to do that since I was in my twenties. So that's been a long time of a goal that I want to do. Now I'm at where my mama says, now, you know, come on. You can't be going to be jumping off of a plane now. I, she too says, old. Just leave it alone around the face. Leave it alone. I said, <laughs> I want to still do it. Do it. You know, just be like Nike. Just do it. You just know? do it. You're never too old. You're, You're never it. too old. I'll bring Swella with me. We'll go down together. Oh. <laughs> But that's it. what you did, though, uh, 
Oh, that is amazing. No, I just thought of the I just airplane. Thought an airplane. You did too? The, in the wheelchair. In, in the, the wheelchair? No, I didn't. Yeah. I, I wasn't in no. the wheelchair. Well, he wasn't in there, airplane. but it was there yeah. waiting for him when he got to the ground. Yeah, when I, so yeah, did, you go on, uh, did you go on top of someone? Because that's the way I'm going. I'm <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you had to. I had to do tandem, you know. So I was gonna go on top of something. What does tandem mean? Two what people. A buddy? Two people. Yeah. A, yeah. And it, yeah, that's there's what a, I'm there's doing. An instructor and myself. Mm -hmm. like you put so many hours in, you can go by yourself. You know. I'm but not you know, interested. For, for me, it was. It was. It was. Uh, I wanted to do it. I did it. But you know, I've yeah. flown an airplane three times now. You know, so. To me, is I rather do that. You know, I did the over the edge thing. I've done a bunch of crazy stuff. You know, wheelchair football, <laughs> basketball, broke my leg playing wheelchair football, went in the hospital. You know, so I'm still, you know. Oh my God. You know, but you know, life is good. You know, yes, it is. Good. I agree. I agree. It is. Well, I don't like all that jumping out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, the yeah. height itself. Looking down, like oh. Don't look down. Don't look down. You're not. You're not supposed to look down. <laughs> and, and you know, funny thing about that is, um, one of the guys that uh, when I was uh, at work, when I showed him the video, now he's looking at the video. When they open up the door of the airplane, and and then you know, look at he almost fell out of his chair. I say, hey man, the video you just watching, you not there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh. so you know. Brooke, you gonna go? You gonna yeah, jump Brooke, off? I'm totally in. I'm in. I'm going. Oh, okay. Wow. We're going to do it next year? You go, we're going to do over the edge so. again. We're doing over the edge again. And that's what I'd like to do. I'm terrified, but it's. I feel like it's, you know, mind over matter. Well, if you go, I'll go with you. Oh, okay. Wow. Go. Now, now we're going we to keep this. Let me make sure I get the date. <laughs> well, it's been recorded, you know? So you yeah, that's it right. It's recorded. <laughs> Richard, you going though? You ain't yeah, scared of nothing. Go. What about you, Brooke? I mean, uh, Taylor. Taylor ain't doing it. <laughs> Taylor, look at oh, I, I'm looking away now. She's looking away. <laughs> Who are they talking to now? <laughs> you don't even turn on the mute off the mute. Uh, she's like, I, I... <laughs> I love it. Are you out there, Rhonda? See, you know. Oh yeah, I'm coming. I'm there. I got all of these four, one, two, three, four commitments. Okay. I'd like to come. Mm -hmm. No. No, uh, no. We got you on contract now. You you sit over there. <laughs> all, anyway, right. all right. All right. We're going to go That's on. That's great. Thank you so much. That was good. All right. Moving right along. Uh, Brooke, you're going to tell us about our service dogs. I am. Animals is okay. healers. I don't know if the animals will go over the edge, Charles is saying. No, it'd be too scary. Animal yeah. assisted therapy can reduce pain and anxiety in veterans with a range of health problems. What is pet therapy? Pet therapy is a broad term that includes animal assisted therapy and other animal assisted activities. Animal assisted therapy is a growing field that uses dogs or other animals to help people recover from or better cope with health problems such as heart disease, cancer, and mental health disorders. Animal assisted activities, on the other hand, have a more general purpose such as providing comfort and enjoyment for nursing home residents. How does animal assisted therapy work? Imagine you're in the hospital, your doctor mentions the hospital's animal assisted therapy program and asks if you'd be interested. You say yes, and your doctor arranges for someone to tell you more about the program. Soon after that, an assistance dog and its handler visit your hospital room. They stay for 10 or 15 minutes. You're invited to pet the dog and ask the handler questions. Who can benefit from animal assisted therapy? Animal assisted therapy can significantly reduce pain, anxiety, depression, and fatigue in people with a range of health problems. Pet therapy is also used in non medical settings, such as universities and community programs, to help veterans deal with anxiety and stress. For more information, contact the Mayo Clinic Hospital at 57777 East Mayo Boulevard in Phoenix, Arizona, 85054. That is the Mayo Clinic Hospital. Their number 480-515-6296. 480-515-6296. Another 
Another therapy service is seizure response service dog. If you are a veteran or first responder who is interested in applying for a seizure response dog, the following information can determine if you meet the eligibility requirements. Seizure response dog program is limited to veterans suffering from a minimum of one seizure a month. If you have served in any of the branches of the U.S. Armed Forces from any era and have received an honorable discharge, you are a first responder who has a work-related disability, applicants with a PTSD diagnosis are required to be in consistent ongoing counseling and have been under the consistent care of a mental health professional for a minimum of one year prior to applying. Applicants with a history of substance abuse must be abstinent from all substances for a minimum of one year to apply. You can independently attend a two-week residential training program. You are dedicated to maintaining the dog's training throughout the life of the team and can provide for the well-being of the dog approximately $100 a month. You are able to meet the needs of an assistance dog and have appropriate support system in place to do so if or when you are unable to yourself. For more information, contact America's Vet Dog Consumer Service Office at 866-282-8047. That number again, 866-282-8047 or consumer services at vetdogs.org. Consumer services at vetdogs.org. Dot org. Okay, good information. Yep. All right, so on you, Mr. Hot News, winding down. Uh, look, look at everybody. Look, oh, look, at, look at, what is this second? Oh, Rhonda, this is what we call hot, hot. I mean, hot news. Okay. Um, it's like it's like the sun with with the little hot sauce on it. You know, it's as hot and flavorful. Okay. So, <laughs> You know, hot news is uh, it's a, an, a continuation of Black History Month. We are a nation of change makers, a nation of those who stand for equality and freedom. And each February during Black History Month, we honor the Black Americans who came before us and still serve now, standing for their dreams and rights and making a difference for us all. Originally founded as Negro History Week in 1926 by Black American historian and author Carter G. Woodson. It recognized the contributions of African Americans to the country and fostered a better understanding of the Black American experience. In 1976, President George Ford, I mean, President Gerald Ford issued the first African American History Month proclamation, calling upon the American people to celebrate the event each February. Since 1986, National Black uh, African Americans, what we call it now, History Month has lived as a time set aside by law to recognize the contributions of African Americans to our nation. One such group of heroes are the 369th Infantry Harlem Hell Fighters, <clears throat> who were the who were the among the first U.S. regiments to arrive in France for World War One, and among the most highly decorated when it returned. Was the 20, oh, and the most highly decorated when it returned was the 369th Infantry, formerly the 15th Regiment New York Guard, more gallantly known as the Harlem Hellfighters. The 369th was an all-black regiment under the command of mostly white officers, including Commander Colonel William Hayward. General John P. Uh, John J. Pershing assigned the 369th to the 16th Division of the French Army, where they helped repel the German offensive and launch a counter-offensive. The Harlem Hellfighters fought at Chateau Thierry and Ballou Wood with a total of 191 days in combat, longer than any other American unit in the war. My men never retired. They go forward or they die, said Colonel Hayward. Indeed, the 369th was the first Allied unit to reach the Rhine. The extraordinary valor of the 369th earned them fame in Europe and America. Newspapers headlined the feats of Corporal Henry Johnson and Private Needham Roberts. In May 1918, they were defending an isolated lookout post on the Western Front when they were attacked by a German unit. Though wounded, they refused to surrender, fighting on with whatever weapons were at hand. They were the first Americans awarded the Croix de Guerre 
and they were not only the Harlem fight, Hell Fighters to win awards, 171 of its officers, uh, and said, let me say this right, and they were not not only the Hell Hide of uh, Hell Fighters to win awards, 171 of its officers and men received individual medals, and a unit received a Cro de Guerra, Guerra for taking Sechal. Okay, I jacked it up maybe, but you know what? <laughs> But, we understand, but you know, to, and, and 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 my own personal uh, African American experiences, um, I have uh, been. Uh, I have a band, and uh, you know, just, you guys know it. Ronda doesn't know, but uh, we will be playing at the uh, Aquarium of the Pacific next Saturday and Sunday. And if there's any veterans who listen to this show that want to get in. I'll give you tickets to get in if you want to come in. You can go early and watch the show. You don't have to, you know, stick around to see us play, but um, I encourage that. But uh, as of right now, we're supposed to play at 4.15 on both days. And that could change, but, you know, they have, uh, um, there's usually a lot of uh, vendors. You know, you have a lot of uh, um, uh, African uh, clothes and uh, just, you know, things like that and paintings and, you know, but, you know, like being a, a part of this uh, uh, since uh, it's been at least 10 or 12 years we've been playing there. Last month they had the Festival of Human Abilities, which is like, I mean, it's usually packed. And there was probably like a quarter of the people there because of the pandemic, I understand. But, you know, that uh, that just, and they're limiting how many people they want to be in there. But if anybody wants to go to the show, just uh you know you can get in touch send uh an email to kindly at uh info at uh, operationconfidence.org and uh you know right. i will provide i'll make sure i can get the tickets to you whether it be at the at the door or whatever we'll call um it's always good to come and check out things you know and so okay. that would be my african-american uh, uh post for the day good deal we intend to come my niece and my little granddaughter. Okay. All right. All right. So we're winding down now. Uh, we uh, I'm taking away to you, Brooke, as far as closing the show. And I just wanted to say, we're going to miss you, Brooke. You won't be back for a, a month. You have a job off, uh, outside of California. Yeah, I'll be back east doing some work and involve some weekend work. So, but I'll be back. Uh, hopefully at the end of March, but definitely by April, and I'll miss everybody. I know. That's my girl, one of the girls. We can't have you gone, but I do understand work comes first. Sometimes <laughs> it happens. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay, well, let's... Uh... I got internet out there, too. I know. <laughs> you can't I know, slip off. Be... See, it's kind of letting you have it easy. I'm going to give you a hard time. I, I... They got they got Wi-Fi <laughs> everywhere. I don't care. <laughs> My brother was in the Afghanistan war in Afghanistan. You know, me and him were texting back and forth, asking, telling me what's the score at the USC game in the Lakers and stuff. <laughs> well, I don't want to hear that. They got, they got, you know, if you can do it, it in did. Afghanistan, you know, you can do it from where you going? Minnesota? Or is that Mark? No. Massachusetts. They got, yeah. oh, they got Wi-Fi over there. They oh, do have yeah. Wi-Fi, but unfortunately, it's the time change puts me in a conflict with some other scheduled work things in the evening. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. So, and leave her alone, Charles. She'll oh, be back. No. You know, mess her. You know that. See, you know, see, now yeah. I'm, I'm going to be at the aquarium next week. And I came over, you know, last, uh, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, We uh, last month, we played at the aquarium. And I still brought my computer. Yeah, I you broadcast the from there. Built. You know, yeah. I bailed out the uh, Lawrence. So I'm like, hey, you know, you know, they got Wi Fi. <laughs> it was fun to see that too. Yeah, so I'll probably do the same thing from there. Um, oh, that'd be good. Yeah, okay, yeah. Brooke, take it away. We're closing the show. All righty. I'd like to remind our listeners about our amazing advertisement rates. We have 20 and 30 second advertisement slots available. Please email info at operationconfidence.org for more information. That email address again is info at operationconfidence.org and visit Operation Confidence's website at www.operationconfidence.org, our resource page for some amazing resources. Taylor? 
I would like to also inform our viewers and listeners about Amazon Smell. When making your next purchase on Amazon, please go to Amazon Smell and type in Operation Confidence in the Choose Your Organization donation box. Amazon will make a small donation to Operation Confidence. Also, to get involved in Operation Confidence Tiny Houses project, visit our website and send us a message on how you would like to be involved. Okay, so Brooke, you take over world market. I got it. Yeah, to our viewers, we would like to inform you about Operation Confidence Positive Redirection Team, a group of male and female veterans who are mentors having overcome similar challenges and situations transitioning back into mainstream society. To be connected or become a team member, email us at info at operationconfidence.org. We're also excited to inform our listeners about Operation Confidence Combat Boots and Lace Women's Veterans Mentoring and Creative Arts Group. To get involved, please email info at operationconfidence.org. I'm going to say it one more time, info at operationconfidence.org. There you go. Okay, so we're closing our show today. I want to thank our, our guest, Rhonda, for coming on. And, and thank you so much for such informative information. And as always, we want to remind our listeners that the goal for our show is to raise awareness about Operation Confidence and our mission, which is to provide stable housing with a wide range of supportive services including employment opportunities for our vets, especially those with disabilities. So to get involved with our grassroots efforts, please send us an email at info at operationconfidence.org. And visit our website, www.operationconfidence.org. We want to thank you. And oh, by the way, please, we have, as all of you probably know by now, we have a YouTube channel. We need you to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. So closing out, it's on you, uh, my dear friend Charles, to show our video and we want to say goodbye to everyone. And thank you again to our guest, our co-host, and we'll be back for sure next Sunday. All right now. You know, we got to show that, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll see yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> How about, all right now, you know. Closing out. For more information or to be a guest on our show, email info at operationconfidence.org. Bye-bye. See, See ya. All right. Adios. Bye now. <laughs>